Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. As we return to this portion of the study in Ezekiel 33, shall we thank our Heavenly Father for his guidance in bringing us through another week and bringing us into the Sabbath hours where we may study, learn together, and address the items that we need to understand for this time in our history. Shall we now ask for his blessing and his guidance as we open his word today? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for all of the things that you have done for us, all of the guidance, all of the direction, even the difficult directions that you have given. We ask now, Father, as we open your word for your blessing, show us that that we need to understand. There are many things that we are all confronted with at this time. All are needing your guidance and your direction. May your will be done so that we may be able to endure the fire of affliction and to come out on the other side purified. May your spirit attend us and enlighten our minds. May your angels surround us so that we may learn what it takes to draw closer to you. Be with us each one today. May our minds be open to that which you would have us to understand. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as we've come to this verse, Ezekiel 33, 33, we are coming to the last verse in this book. And when this shall come to pass, lo, it will come. Then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. Now, as Sister White writes in Manuscript 28 of 1905, there are those who, notwithstanding all the gracious invitations of Christ, continue to reveal ungodliness in their lives. God addresses all such in the words, How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn ye at my reproof. And I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Now, isn't it interesting that this is something written by Solomon? So how long is this going to have to go on? Now, she coupled that with the following. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, and he took not the warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. If the watchman see the, war the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come, and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hands. Do we want this blood required of us? Do we want to be one that does not give the warning? So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word of my mouth, and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Therefore, O son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus shall ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. 
As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. When I say unto the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousnesses shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he has committed, he shall die for it. Again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. If he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, if the wicked restore the pledge and give again that he hath robbed, Walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity. He shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Now, as this was written in 1905, and the comment that was from the chat, Sister White received the Nashville Fireball Vision in 1905. If I recall correctly, we are to warn sinners whether or not the outcome occurs as we suppose. Do we suppose that the Nashville vision will not occur as she has stated that it will? Or do we accept the fact that Nashville is going to receive a judgment? Yeah, we believe that that's going to happen. Do the rest of you agree with this? Yes. Yes, so, it's going to happen. Okay, so was it a sin then to warn Nashville to repeat what Sister White had stated? No, sin not to warn Nashville. So we are confronted. We have those that believe that giving this warning, standing as a watchman, was a sin. I, for one, do not believe that it was a sin. This was a warning that needed to go out, and it went to the entire world. I do not believe that it is necessary to apologize for giving this message, for revealing that this message had been given to Sister White. So throughout, and as, as it is noted, that the vision was given to her on the 1st of July of 1904. So thank you, brother, for, for that, for this clarification. Here we are. A vision has been given, and a vision had been suppressed. A watchman oh. cannot, cannot withhold the vision and still be a watchman. I just want to say this is a really good question. Thank you for that, because it's a question I'm going to ask my two friends who are saying that it's it was demonic and embarrassing for the church and so on, and that we need to confess and repent from it. And these are not people from the movement. I've, I've had people that are members of the church that have made the same comment to me that this was an embarrassment to the church to have this revealed and that this should be repented upon. Now, this portion of Ezekiel continues. Yet the children of thy people say, the way of the Lord is not equal. But as for them, their way is not equal. When the righteous turneth from his righteousness and committeth iniquity. So in other words, when the righteous turns from doing what he knows to be right and commits sin, he sh even shall die thereby. But if the wicked turns from his wickedness, and does that which is lawful and right, he shall live thereby. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. O you house of Israel, I will judge you every one after his own ways. For I will lay the land most desolate, and the pomp of her strength shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be desolate, that none shall pass through. Then shall they know that I am the Lord when I have laid the land most desolate because of all their abominations which they have committed. So here we have Ezekiel verses 17 to 20 and verses 28 and 29. Also thou son of man, the children of thy people are still talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses and speak to one another. 
every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what the word is that cometh forth from the Lord. Was the warning for Nashville made up with by the people of the movement? Or was this a warning that was given by God through Sister White? The latter is a warning given by God. Yeah, and, you know, you know, when we came up with July 18, 2020, I mean, initially we weren't thinking about Nashville or anything like that. So we, we just started looking for what would the date mean. And, and it ended up being tied to, to Nashville and to a nuclear attack and so forth in ways that really seem unmistakable. But, you know, the, the warning to Nashville in some ways is somewhat separate, right? It's not like, like if it's a nuclear attack, which we first determined that it must be, then, you know, the question was, well, where do we have a nuclear attack in the spirit of prophecy? You know, where would it occur? And so in my thinking, and I guess Odilio's as well, was Ellen White's Nashville vision dealing with the fireball on Nashville. But even, even when I, I, I knew that it was possible that we could fail in our prediction, even if I thought that it wasn't going to happen, I would still think it would be important to warn them, even if you had the slightest bit of doubt. Okay. It, it would have not been... Uh, very Christian, do not warn them. Especially if we have confidence in the spirit of prophecy. What does it say to us when others are telling us that we need to apologize for the words of the spirit of prophecy? That they will deny it in, when under pressure. Now, consider this next sentence in the current as well as the prior past manner. This scripture represented the spiritual condition of many in Battle Creek. Does this scripture represent the spiritual condition of many within leadership of the church and within many of us in the movement today? Sorry, which statement? I'm asking the question. Since this statement that Mrs. White has made says that this scripture, 3330 of Ezekiel, represented the spiritual condition of many within Battle Creek. Is this representing us today? Are we choosing to accept the words of the spirit of prophecy as the words of the Lord and giving a warning message? To the world or should we apologize for these warnings how do you see it apologize for not warning them sooner and teaching them reaching out giving them holding evangelistic series there etc now mrs white's next brother, brother Dwight, yes I think people who think, tell other people that they need to apologize for it and have apologized should, should repent and ask God to forgive them. Yes. Because, because, because to me, it's, it's like you denying Christ when you, when you, when you do something like that in a way he moves us. I think that your, your statement goes right in line with a statement that's in the chat right now. Regretting the references to the Spirit of Prophecy's warnings is behaving like Satan through Peter contradicting Christ when he described what he was to suffer and how he would die. If we set aside the Spirit of Prophecy, are we not setting aside the very words of God? Yeah. Now, Mrs. White makes the following statement about this, where she stated that this scripture represented the spiritual condition of many in Battle Creek. They burlesque the messages in mercy sent them by the Lord to save the erring from their errors. Now, I found that, that statement, that the use of that word, intriguing. Now, if I'm understanding it correctly, to burlesque a message 
would be to treat it as if it was absurd or comically exaggerated. Yeah, it's kind of like a mockery, a mocking. Now, as we have been studying through the weeks, we have looked at how so many, beginning with Uriah Smith, have mocked the warnings of Leviticus 26. They want to say, well, this is this is not a prophecy. This is not this. This is not that. But are they not indeed warnings? Are the warnings of Leviticus 26 not there to say, if you do not follow my commands and my statutes, these will be the things that will happen to you? And are we not as watchmen supposed to give the warning message when it is provided from on high? We cannot afford to make this and turn this into something comical. We cannot afford to mock the warnings that God has given. Because if we do, are we not very much like those that stood before Noah, before the flood? Amen. And they come to thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice, and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come. Then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. Now, this next portion was a non-published written September 27th of 1906, which was the eighth day of the seventh month, both in the biblical calendar and the rabbinic calendar. In a vision of the night, I was given a message for those bearing large responsibility in the work of God in California. Are there any others that we see in the Bible that are given a vision of the night, a vision upon their bed? Wasn't Daniel given such a vision? Samuel. Okay. So if it's a vision given on their bed, this is just an opinion, right? Or is this a direction? from on high. Here she quotes Ezekiel 33, 7 to 9. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the words at my mouth, and shall warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked of his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, and he doth not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. The chapter in which these words are found will need to be understood, or men will plead a contradiction in the work and the messages that God gives his servants. Over these last many weeks, We have taken a a side trip from our study of the Minor Prophets. I looked last night. It was 28 weeks ago that we were last in Zechariah. And we were looking at some very specific situations of the book of Zechariah. Now, do you recall why we made this side trip into Ezekiel? Do you recall what Mrs. White had stated was important for us to understand? I do not. When we were looking and studying through the book of Zechariah, we came to a point where Mrs. White stated very directly that we needed to understand the work that God approves and the work that God does not approve. We looked at 
Ezekiel 8, and we looked at, at Ezekiel 9. This is a representation of the work that God does not approve. But Ezekiel 33, she states, is an example of the work that God does approve. If God has set the a watchman under the house of Israel, if God has stated this is the warning that is to be given today to the movement and to the church, this is the warning that is given to us. If we choose not to give that warning and the wicked die, then the blood of the wicked is on us. If the warning is given and the warning does not, does not make the wicked to turn from their iniquity, then we will deliver our souls. We need to be very careful to understand the words that we have been going over in this portion. We need to understand this chapter even more fully than we have before. The prophet continues, when I say to the righteous man that he shall surely live, if he trust in his own righteousness and commits iniquity, all of his righteousness shall not be remembered. But for the iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Is this saying once saved, always saved? I don't think so. I agree. Again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die if he turns from his sin and does that which is lawful and right. If the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he had robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity. He shall not surely die, he shall live. None of the sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He that hath done that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. Yet the people of the children of thy people say, The way of the Lord is not equal. But as for them, their way is not equal. When the righteous turneth from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, he shall even die thereby. But if the wicked turn from his wickedness and do that which is lawful and right, he shall live thereby. Here again, Mrs. White repeats verses 30 to 33. Also, thou son of man, the, chil the children of thy people are still talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses. And speak to one another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you. And hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee as the people cometh. And they sit before thee as, thy, as my people. And they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love. But their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come. Then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. This next paragraph is quite blunt. Our relation to God and his government is one of personal responsibility. No man can perform his neighbor's duty for him or carry his neighbor's responsibility. He will not be excused if he neglects his duty in any line, for the Lord requires the strictest fidelity. So, brothers and sisters, are you responsible for my sins? Am I responsible for yours? If Mrs. White is to be believed, our relation to God and his government is one of personal responsibility. Isn't this the theme that we see throughout Scripture? Are we not to accept that we are personally responsible to follow the commands and the statutes of God? The minister will be called to give a strict account of his work in the ministry. If, though, understanding what the will of the Lord is, he weaves his own ideas into the work and carries out his own purposes in the giving of the message, if instead of giving to the people a thus saith the Lord, he gives a thus saith man, God will bring his work to naught. 
he will not suffer his case to be misrepresented, his faithful workmen to be distressed by the course of those who seek to carry out their own ideas and plans rather than the plans of God. God looks to every worker for a faithful presentation of the message entrusted to him, but no man is to take upon himself responsibilities and burdens that the Lord has not laid upon him. No messenger, however responsible his position, is to seek to dominate the consciousnesses of others. What does that mean to you? How do you read this? Well, I mean, it's pretty clear that uh, that our work in ministering to others is not controlling their conscience, not controlling them. Okay. And so we need to be faithful in the things that we are doing. We need to bring lift people higher by our example and by our words, but um, we can't control the work. And often what people are doing really, the reason why they're doing that, if, if we were doing God's work, we could entrust the results to God. But often the reason why people want to control others is because it's their work, their ways, their ideas that are being put forward. Does that make sense? Okay. How many how many times have we heard a comment that it's my way or the highway? I've I've never heard anybody actually say that. But okay. July seven July seven, two thousand thirteen. Really? My disel disfellowship. My I mean, daddy he, said my daddy has told me that a whole lot of time when I was younger. It's my okay. way or the highway. I've seen people act that way. But I don't know if I've ever heard anybody actually say that. But I mean, you know, uh, I have had people, you know, during a, you know, football game, the guy who owns the ball taking it and saying, you know, if we're not going to play according to his rules, he, he's taking the ball home and going home. So I guess that's kind of the same thing. My house, my rules. Right. That one can be fair. Well, but also put, push well, to an extreme. You, you might not have heard it like said like that, but you see it. You see it by the attitude they show when they how they act towards another person. But you know, even even raising my children, you know, may, maybe that's you know, maybe people would disagree with me, but it was never you know, ever was I would press, you know, my will upon the children. Even if I wanted them to do something, you know, I wouldn't yell at them and demand things of them. Uh, I, I would try to work with them. So, you know, but I've seen a lot of people when it comes to like their children and how they talk to them. I remember my daughter, Diana, was very surprised at how her friend's parents talked to them. Right. She would just because she had never heard that type of of demanding and yelling and name calling and bullying basically mm. you know in her home growing up mm. but a lot of people are like that and they deal that way in the church as well yeah with uh with josh you know I'm quite intelligent so I'd, I'd ask him to do something and he would come back with another way of doing something that he felt more comfortable with or Whatever, and if it was reasonable, I'd say, sure, that sounds okay. Do it that way. And isn't that how God deals with us? Come and reason. Let us reason together. And he'll yes. reason with us as well. But, th but there are people who really believe in that sort of authoritative way of doing things. You know, and, and, and they show that in how they deal with others in the church. And, and you know, so to them, there isn't this... You know, it's not like they're doing something wrong. They really believe that philosophy that because they have the authority, other people should do what they ask. We had a pastor like that. He was Russian, but uh, but that's what he believed. He didn't like people making their own decisions in the church. Everything had to go through him. Right. Yeah, so to be able to trust that God's going to work in other people's lives is very important. Roughly 12 years ago, maybe a bit, a bit maybe a bit further back. There was quite an issue that was raised where this conference, through some of its ministers, sent letters to people 
to state that you will not speak about Leviticus 26 on the grounds of the church or in your homes. That's a wow. That's more like it, a Marxist, Marxist statement. Okay. I won't the order disagree. Went even, the, order went even, the order went even further with me. It was at church or, or in my home or social media or email. Complete silence was demanded. Now, is this not attempting to dominate the consciousness of others? Yeah, to control other people's conscience. The and the role of the Holy Spirit. And it's not the way that God works with us. We have to decide. Are we trying to control others or are we presenting things for them to consider? Are we giving the warning message that God would seek to have given? Or are we going to withhold that message because it could raise too many people's questions and might disturb them and might bring them out of their slumber? Here's that basic spiritual principle again in recovery is attraction, not promotion. Okay. It's basically live it and if people like it they'll be attracted to it but if you're pushing it people push back they tend to resist so there's a balance in it this is why it's clear that we are not to take upon ourselves responsibilities and burdens that the lord has not laid upon us are we to be watchmen are we to stand to give a message for are we not to all of us, not just pastors, not just conference employees, are we not to represent Christ to the world? Is this not what we are told? Again and again, the case of the Southern California Conference has been presented to me. In this conference, some who have been long in the message have warped the work and greatly hindered its progress. At one of the camp meetings in Los Angeles, it was proposed that all the members of the conference should be delegates. I've had to meet this proposition and say that it ought not to be adopted. In various conferences, this plan has worked in fusion. And light was given me that we should not follow a plan that would so open so wide a door for perplexity and for confusion. Now, throughout this this manuscript throughout these warnings that Mrs. White expanded upon from the book of Ezekiel. We have been shown that the warning is to go out. The warning is not to be hindered. The warning is not to be swept under the rug. It is not to be treated as if it is just of man and it's not to be treated as something for which we should be embarrassed. Those that would seek to apologize for giving of this message are not watchmen. And while that's a hard thing to hear, it's also a hard thing to have to say. We do not know the hearts of others. It's not our job to know the hearts of others. It is our job to stand as a watchman upon the wall. Now, do you have any other comments or thoughts about what we've what we've been addressing here today? I've got a question. Go ahead. Um, what of if, like, uh, for example, a relative of yours whom you're staying with, they like uh, taking things which do not belong to them. Then uh, whenever like you tell them in a soft way, they repeat the same thing. You give them warnings, but uh, it's like they don't want. They, they like doing that. From warning, they go do the same thing. Right. Yeah. In that case, how can you treat that uh, situation? I ask myself three questions. Is it, is it illegal, immoral? or life-threatening. If not, then they're free to make that decision. 
illegal? Uh, it's, uh, um, it's like uh, threatening because maybe okay, they can well, take okay. something something from somewhere, then uh, something bad can happen. Sounds illegal and immoral and possibly life-threatening, all three, really. If they put themselves in danger. So what do you think? What, what are you doing? What are you trying to do? Other than just speak, is there a consequence that, that you say if they continue? A progressive consequence, perhaps? T tell us more about it. Uh, I tell you more about it. Yeah, because uh, um, the, the, the part where Theodore came in and uh, he was explaining how, like, uh, his uh, his daughter, like, when she, she visits the friends, how the parents are, like, used to react towards their, their kids. And uh, she was more like... Um, Surprised with uh, with the treatment which was coming from there. Uh, it's more like uh, you you keeping someone, then that person uh, staying under your roof. They don't want to go to church, but they are going to school. They don't want to go to church. Whenever you tell them to do this, they do the opposite. If no one is home, they'll take anything from the house. Mm -hmm. When you confront them, tell them the truth. They look like innocent as if they've heard but they will repeat the same thing the next day. That's why I'm asking, like I was asking. So in that situation, how do you treat a situation like that? So it's a family member, your daughter? Yeah, my son. Your son? Yes. And how, how old? 17. Almost an adult in this country? Yes, yes. It's just that here, it's, it's uh, totally different uh, with that side. Because that side, when a person reaches 18, they are free to be staying on their own, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but here it's uh, it's a different uh, scenario. It's a different story. Oh, is it younger? This is what country? <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's, an, it's, uh, it's in Africa. In Africa. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's pretty tough to uh, turn someone out of the home, I imagine, in Africa, that you could really raise the risk for them. Yeah, because uh, you, you like, you care for them. You don't want anything bad to happen to them. But whenever you talk to them, they do the opposite. Whenever you warn them about what they're doing, that it's not right, we'll do the opposite. Well, there's you sit, down with them, yeah, you sit down with them, have uh, Bible studies. In doing that, yeah. There's there's measured measured consequences that increase in, as well. I mean, you could begin with any privileges that they have that you have control over. You could restrict them in those areas. Show them that you know it's going to hurt them if they continue. Sometimes that wakes a person up or it makes them rebel more, but. Really, uh, I don't know, to sit down with them, reason with them, ask them why are they doing it, what are they thinking, what are they feeling, are they angry, are they sad? Children well, I, I mean, it's pretty difficult to, you know, to give advice on a situation like this because there's just so many, so many things we don't know. But, you know, God can give you wisdom to to deal with the situation but it may not turn out the way you want that's just the reality the one thing i i've found is that no matter what i say to someone people pretty much do what they want to do no mm -hmm. matter what i say so, so yeah that's where thank you for that theodore that's where we leave leave it in, in god's hands yeah and so, and you know, the thing is, there's so much that's not in our control. And one is other people's behavior. But there are things that are within our control. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we, we have certain sort of, you know, like we own our own house and things like that. I mean, there are things that we can do. But how that's going to affect, if we think that we're going to change the other person by our actions or by, you know, if we're trying to change the other person, that's, you know, that that's not something in our control. Amen. Right. So. 
so yeah, sometimes relationships ends, end with people because um, what they're doing is damaging to themselves and to, to us and to others. And so it doesn't mean that we hate them or have rejected them or anything. Because uh, God, he, he allows consequences to happen to us of our own actions. He doesn't withhold us from consequences. But he doesn't force us either. So, anyway, Dwight, so you're done there? Yep, this this portion is complete as far as Ezekiel 33. Yeah. Ezekiel. And you're saying we went to Ezekiel 33 from, well, Ezekiel, from when we were studying uh, Zechariah. And what was the particular reason again that Ellen White moved to Ezekiel as we, the... as we had studied in Ezekiel four or excuse me Zechariah four and five yeah Mrs. White made a very specific representation that Ezekiel eight and nine and the the prophecy that is that is part of that is the work that God does not approve. And that Ezekiel 33 is a representation of the work that God does approve. Does approve, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so obviously the compromise with sin and the warning against God's judgments against sin, those are two contradictory, two contrasting things. But too many times we find that the situation is that we are not looking to the personal responsibility. We are trying to go along with the groupthink mentality that as long as the group has approved what's going on, then we're doing the right thing rather than doing it because we have accepted our responsibility and mm -hmm. the fact that we have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm reminded of the, the quote that the world needs men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall, though the whole world stand against them. That's not easy to do. No, it's not. It's, it's needed. So this has been, for me, a, a very pointed lesson. It's also a very pointed direction as to what our responsibility is. We need to accept God's word in total. The word that we find in the scripture, the word that we find in the spirit of prophecy, as being what we are to live by in commands and statutes. And if we choose to set any of these aside, we do it to our own eternal damnation. Shall we now close this study with a word of prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the warnings, the admonitions, and the instructions of your prophets. Help us today, Father, that we might close, more closely understand that which we are to understand and we are to know regarding our own personal responsibilities. Help us now, direct us. We pray, Father, that we will understand the words that are soon to be presented in this next meeting. We ask, Father, for your blessing upon Theodore as he provides this blessing for us. May your will be done here in our lives, in this meeting, as your will is done in heaven. For we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.